I love that intro. I love that intro. Welcome, everyone, to Hard Lens Media, and shout out to our Can TV audience. If you want to learn more about Hard Lens Media, please follow us on YouTube, Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey, and Kick. Good to have all of you here with us. We're live at 9 a.m. Central on all those video platforms. So to our Can TV audience, check us out. But now I am proud to return back a or have a guest returning back onto our show. He has been a speaker of truth to power. He was recently overseas in Egypt, and we are going to be speaking to him about his firsthand account of what he saw there. As we all know, there is a devastating, horrific conflict that is happening. There is a genocide happening in Gaza. As at this point right now, uh, current estimates around 28,000 uh, civilians have been killed uh, with the actions of the Israeli Defense Forces. And so now... I think it's important that we hear on the ground uh, or hear hear from somebody who was on the ground there. Give it up for none other than Nico House, who is in the house. Nico, good friend of the show. How are you, my friend? What's going on, man? Sorry I'm late, bro. We got like a whole storm happening right now in Rio that kind of oh. came out of nowhere. But which kind of <laughs> sucks because, you know, it's Carnival right now. So, Oh, it is? Out. Yeah, oh, man. It's Carnival. No. It's Carnival. No. Uh, but, it, man, look, these people have been drunk for a week now, okay? <laughs> It's all right. They can miss a day. <laughs> they can miss a day. These people have been drunk for about a good solid week. A good solid week. So, so they can, they can miss a day. Yeah, okay. So, 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 so it's fine. But at least everyone's having a good time. And let, I hope everyone is safe and enjoying themselves. But as much as I like to talk about Carnival and all the great action and beauty that can be seen there, I need to make a trip, plan a trip to Brazil. Um, recently, you did something that uh, I have to give a shout out to. You went to Egypt to find out firsthand what is happening on the ground there. Now, for our viewers and subscribers, obviously, we have all seen the horrific imagery on social media. We have seen firsthand accounts of men, women, and children uh, being blown up, shot at by the Israeli Defense Forces. We are witnessing a genocide happening. And to many people who are unaware or uneducated about the crisis, some will just blurt out, well, why can't they go ahead and cross the border? Why can't they go, the, the Palestinian people, run and seek shelter in other countries? I mean, they have to do that. I mean, that, that, that seems like the only reasonable choice. And you were in Egypt. First of all, for our viewers, why did you uh, uh, fly over to Egypt? What were you hoping to see there? And can you at least explain to us uh, what you saw there on the ground Um with what is happening currently in Gaza. So this entire time, I feel like, you know, you, myself, probably a lot of people in the chat, uh, but definitely the content creator is some type of influence. It, it sucked feeling powerless, right? We can talk about the issue all we want to, but at the end of the day, a lot of us had a desire to do more. And so, um, you know, I was blessed enough to have an opportunity that was given to me by a Palestinian ran nonprofit to go to Egypt to help send aid to Gaza, to help package aid, to visit orphans and, and engage and talk to them, uh, to record obviously what, what we saw there. Um, and, and, and then in my particular case, bring that message back to the people. Uh, and it was, it, when I say it was a very fortunate opportunity, mm. so, um, I never really considered myself a quote unquote social media influencer. I usually that's like the fashion people, you know, the, the health exercise guys. Um, and that was actually the group of people that I went with. It was uh, it well, I was very impressed because there, there were a lot of people that decided to take time out of their normal routine, their normal lives, a life that a lot of them uh, get to live in luxury uh, because of their social media presence. And they all went to Egypt. But I was contacted based off of a couple of viral videos that I had done on Instagram mm -hmm. and was given that opportunity as well. Uh, and that was with the goal, obviously, of kind of codifying and, and contextualizing what we're seeing in, 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 on, a grand, on a grander scale. You know, because a lot of people understand just the Gaza aspect of it, the genocide aspect of it, but they're not really understanding the reverberating impact that all of this is having. And they also, a lot of the times, don't understand why certain countries or certain entities are making the decisions they make, whether it be Gazans actively choosing uh, uh, a lot of times to remain in Gaza, uh, despite the reality that they could be bombed at any given moment, or uh, Egypt making the decision to kind of fortify their borders and reminding Israel that they just can't bully Palestinians across the border 
uh, just because they want to make new beach houses in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So what, what I want to ask is when, when you were on the ground there, because I remember seeing that video that you posted on social media, and I encourage everyone to please follow Nico House. He's been doing some phenomenal work. You mentioned you saw more than just Palestinian refugees in Egypt, yeah. to which, to be fair here, no country can carry the burden of a conflict all by themselves. But in my opinion, from what you saw, it seems like Egypt is carrying a lot of burdens, not only from the war in Israel that's happening, uh, that they're imposing upon Gaza, but America's involvement is there, too. Uh, what what? What what was actually who who were who was also in these refugee camps besides Palestinian refugees? So I went to a, a school, an orphanage slash school that was actually in a predominantly Syrian neighborhood, and the school itself was predominantly Syrian. It had a few Iraqis there, um, Egypt, a couple of Egyptian orphans as well, but primarily it was Syrian, and I was a little confused because you know we hear a lot about the Palestinian refugees crossing through the Rafah border, even prior to the genocide that initially started uh, in October 7th. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is that there is hundreds of thousands of Syrians in Egypt. And that's something that never really gets discussed on the news. So my curious self was like, so what is going on? Like, y'all have a whole community here Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are orphans because of the war that the U.S. started uh, and that Israel started and is participating in. And I asked, well, is this the only situation that's like this? So is it Palestinians and, and, and is it Palestinians and Syrians? They're like, oh, no, there's Iraqis too. A bunch. I was like, well, who else? They're like Sudanese, South Sudanese. Um, uh, there, there's one more that has a huge population. So, uh, no, uh, Somalians. There's a lot of Somalians there as well. And if you notice the pattern, it's a bunch of people from countries that are undergoing conflict that specifically have been caused by the United States and a lot of the time Israel. And, and Egypt is, it, to some degree, they, they've been like paid to take in these, these uh, refugees. And it's because Egypt needs the money, unfortunately. Like, that's the reality of the situation. But like most African countries, Egypt needs the money. However, it's also an attempt to cover up the, the, the damage and the consequences that have come from Western imperialism. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy about this is you hear these Zionists making these, this argument that because Egypt's an Arab country, they should be willing to take in Arab refugees. Why, you know, that they should, which is racist as hell. Like, they, they have their own culture. Uh, yeah, they might both speak Arabic, but it's different dialects normally. Um, just because a person is Muslim and Arab doesn't mean that y'all have the exact same culture. Uh, and, and nor does it mean you should bear the, res the, the brunt of the responsibility for something that you didn't cause, especially whenever your resources are limited. And you, these Western countries, these Zionist uh, talking heads, aren't are avoiding the fact that, like, no, y'all cause these problems. Shouldn't y'all be bearing the responsibility? But mm -hmm. they actively go out of the way to be like, no, we can't have these refugees in our country. They start labeling them terrorists. They invite the Ukrainians, you know, the Ukrainians, the same Ukraine with a bunch of neo-Nazis. They invite them in with open arms. <laughs> but they, they want to invite, they want to allow the Hondurans to come in, the Palestinians to come in, the Sudanese to come in, the Somalians to come in without constantly uh, uh, scapegoating them for the potential dangers. I'm like, well, they wouldn't, but they, you, they wouldn't be here if you aren't destroying their country. And they don't want to have that conversation because then, of course, you would have to, they would have the burden of, of assuming responsibility. But they want Egypt to assume the responsibility that those particular Western countries don't even want to assume. So let me ask you this, because you've done a lot, your fair share of activism and protesting, as well as actually doing the legal work, most notably uh, with the uh, unfortunate 2016 Democratic primary. And you mm -hmm. were one of the very few people. You were part of a coalition of people, though. Uh, but you, you guys were the dauntless few uh, that were actually taking on the challenge of calling out what was happening uh, during that election cycle. And since then, you've covered a lot of protests. You've covered a lot of events. You've, you've been uh, very uh, vocal in regards for people speaking out. But recently now, we have seen this, the beginning, I think, maybe a second form 
of the anti-war movement. We're seeing a lot of people vocally speak out against the genocidal actions of the apartheid government of Israel towards the Palestinian people. And corporate media is struggling, struggling now, and I love seeing it, to uh, really defend Israel's actions. I mean, it's it's undeniable with all the posts that we we're seeing on social media, the horror. And no, I will not be playing those videos on this platform or any platform because yeah, it's horrific. Really can't. Look at yeah, it's 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 it is not for the faint of heart, and it's already out there. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows about it. But something else has caught my attention too, and it is from the right. Now, obviously, we all know that there are their fair share that the right has its fair share of SJWs and those that's, that are diehard defenders of Israel. Uh, but there was a recent back and forth between, or is it at? I wouldn't say call it a back and forth. Tucker Carlson called out. Ben Shapiro. Yeah. And, and yeah. then we're seeing then we're seeing a couple other cons uh, most I think also Kenneth Owens I believe was also calling out the actions of Israel's uh, uh, attacks. Now, I'm not expecting anyone on the right to, you know, linking arms with us and us singing kumbaya, but it ha but it is a breaking of a narrative that we're so used to seeing where the right and yes, we know we know that obviously there's neoliberals uh who are in the Democratic Party that that go the bad for Israel, but this little uh Vision or this this little uh, fracturing between the uh, right wing pundits and right wing commentators is a fascinating study. And I just want to get your thoughts on that, especially with Tucker Carlson and Kenneth Owens calling out Israel's genocidal actions. Yeah, so Kenneth Owens, I've probably been the most impressed by when it comes to mm -hmm. it, this particular conflict because Candace is an interesting thought experiment. Uh, I don't know what it is, honestly, because. She'll get an issue because this isn't the only issue that she's gotten right when it comes to like what I would consider to be a leftist issue. She's great mm -hmm. on, on, on prison reform. Uh, she's great on calling out the inconsistencies and the problematic nature of the prison industrial complex. But that's because she also had a brother who was affected by it. Um, True. Uh, do I believe that her, um, her commentary on Gaza is genuine? I do believe it because for the first time ever, which is crazy to say, but this is mm -hmm. really the first time ever Candace Owens is actually putting something on the line for a cause that doesn't really align with the majority of her ideology, which is she's fighting. She brought on Norm Finkelstein to her program mm -hmm. that is an affiliate of Ben Shapiro's network. <laughs> <laughs> like out of that is like the the trifecta of all like for Candace Owens to already challenge Ben Shapiro on this particular issue the way she did prior to that, and then to bring on Norm Finkelstein in the midst of Norm Finkelstein actively challenging Ben Shapiro to a debate on the issue, mm -hmm. that's like I ain't gonna lie, that was kind of a boss move. That was kind of it a is. boss move. It, I wasn't expecting it. That's not my bingo card. But then again, 2024 is the year of the dragon. It's supposed to be a year of good luck. That, and, that know, is facts. I, I mean, I mean, so so who knows? So who knows? Dragon uh, year, man. Yeah, it's, I'm a it's dragon in case anybody's curious. Oh wow. So, any so, questions? So, I got you. So, so so then so then you got the double good luck then. But it's it is for, for me witnessing this, I just wonder if there's maybe some kind of bigger game that's being played, or either that, maybe everyone's just tired of defending Israel. Because it's because it's been defended for so long. At this point, you you cannot defend a a a country that's supposed to be a end quote democracy as they're going to be bombing a city with 1.4 million people. And mind you, Rafa is isn't a major me metropolitan city. They were already overcrowded as as it was yeah. before the conflict. It was the most it was the most densely populated city in in Gaza. Yeah, and, and now there's 1.4 million people, and I was recently on Due Dissidence, and myself and Keaton were discussing it, and what does the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, state? Well, the people have been informed that they can go up north, or there's another area, but as I'm reading articles, the Palestinian people have are stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's either if they if they choose to leave the city, there's no guarantee that they're going to be safe because they can still get shot at, a helicopter strike right. or a artillery strike can yeah. get them, or if they stay in, X, Y, and Z is going to happen to them as well. They, they, they're, they're not still only they're not a guarantee; it's oh, yeah. almost guaranteed that they're not safe if they leave the city. It's, I mean, they, it, it's all—it's also a guarantee, unfortunately, that they are unsafe if they stay in the city, which is the point. It's a genocide. Uh, We—I mean, I don't know if you—you you heard, but uh, <laughs> this man Netanyahu unilaterally nixed all hostage negotiations without even talking to his cabinet. Mm -hmm. Well, he well, nicks all there that happened to 
yesterday. Well, it happened. Wow. Yeah, it happened last night. It was raining about last night. Yeah. Jesus Christ. In other words, what? So what is this about? Because we we've been told every single day it's about the hostages. That's mm -hmm. that is and that what the Super Bowl ad was about. Yeah. How do you we all that, saw that. that shitty Super Bowl ad trying to try, trying to pull at the heartstrings of, of Americans and this, which is super weird, by the way, because it's like what they're not our hostages. Like, what are you talking? Why are you paying? Why are you spending seven million dollars of our tax money to send us an ad during the Super Bowl? Like, we could do something about the shit. Because what it really they, is they is that we know money. that they're not going to continue to get the support they need from the from the uh, from Congress and from uh, the Biden administration, at least publicly, without our approval. And they're losing the propaganda battle bad. But yeah, man, it's it's he literally it's it's not about the hostages. He's made it very clear. I mean, it it was obvious before this. Let's be real. It was it was obvious whenever people forget November mm -hmm. in November. Hamas is like, let's just do 100% prison exchange in exchange for a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everybody also, wins. I, I'm also hoping you could help elaborate on this just a little bit more here, too, because I also have the website and I want to share that the launch good. But before we pull that up here, um, Charlie Kirk brought this up, you know, and I look, I have my differences with that person, but I found it interesting. Not once, but twice. He made this very interesting statement. First, they're in the beginning stage of the war. In which he stated, look, I've been to Israel a lot of times, and it makes no sense how they didn't see this coming. And then a few months later, the New York Times, I'm surprised they posted this article, indicating that Israeli intelligence services were given a heads up a year ago before this conflict happened, that mm -hmm. something was going to happen. Now, if we look at Gaza before uh, this horrific war happened, it was an open air prison, still is, world's most one-sided fistfight, concrete walls, watchtowers, surveillance cameras, drones, uh, everything, you name it, Israel had it. And Charlie Kirk brought up the fact that was there a stand down order that happened? And the fact that this article coming off from the New York Times saying that, hey, uh, something's happening within a year. There's something building up and Israel and its security forces does nothing. Plus, you know, before this war was going on, there were massive amounts of protests that were happening against Benjamin Netanyahu's government. Yeah, there was a buildup. Yeah. Could, could you explain to our audience just overall what was happening before before October 7th, this, this crisis? Because the way I look at it and the way I would compare it, if you want to have people ignore your domestic issues, just do a wag the dog moment. Yeah. So funny enough, before October 7th happened, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uh, videos that had been coming out where Israel was destroying homes in Gaza and the West Bank. But in Gaza, uh, specifically, they had gotten caught killing a few people. Um, it was you can almost feel like a tension brewing. And speaking to the to the fact that Israel was aware a year in advance. It's almost as if they wanted to make sure it was going to happen. That's the sense that I get, right? Because like maybe they're going to change their plans. So what do you do? You advance your military. You antagonize them more. You destroy more homes so that you can make sure that they are incentivized to follow through so that you can achieve your ultimate goal, which is the genocide of the Palestinian people and the, the, the procurement of their land. That's basically what it comes out as to me. And... Not only did they know a year in advance, uh, as, according to intelligence, but even their stock market had some some shifty, uh, some shifty movement where people were selling things and buying things and profited significantly off of betting against the market. And it happened right before the event happened, like a couple of days before the event happened. It was super weird. And like it was like the only type of the, they were making the type of move that you can only make if you had insider uh, trading tips. So <laughs> yeah, like, no, nah, it was, I actually did a video on it, um, for hotspot, but to, to, to make a long story short, there was a huge buildup. Not even, a, I, remember, I remember whenever October 7th happened, I was like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Did y'all not witness what we've been witnessing for the last three weeks? People were genuinely saying there was a, there was a, a ceasefire prior to October 7th. And I, I my mind was blown, kid. Because I was watching videos two days before that mm -hmm. where Israel had killed somebody, had killed a child, had bulldozed a home, had attacked. Like, and it was funny enough, at that point, they weren't using Hamas to justify it. They were just doing it because, hell, they've always been able to get away with it. Nobody's ever said anything. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that October 7th achieved or uh, helped achieve for Israel 
that may have been a quote unquote positive for them in the beginning, not really a positive, but a positive for them propaganda wise, is that it gave them a demagogue, it gave them a scapegoat. By, by them being able to constantly say Hamas, 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 they don't have to say pro-Palestine protesters. They don't have to say anti-apartheid protesters. They'll just continue to say pro-Hamas, like a, uh, Eric Adams in New York got approached by a pro-Palestine protester specifically bringing up kids. He's like, bro, you cool with all these kids dying? And he's like, bring the hostages home. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they labeled them, the protesters, a pro-Hamas. Pro what, is, what does Hamas have to do with you bombing kids indiscriminately? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've been wondering overall, when people are going to wake up and not expect or stop expecting much from our politicians. As we all know, APAC, like any lobby group, has bought both Democratic and Republican politicians. Oh, no, I got no, I got to I got to interrupt, man. Okay, APAC go is ahead. not like any lobbying group. Mm, APAC ahead. is the lobbying group. They have the most influence. They mm -hmm. spend the most money and they have to such a degree that almost all of the wars that we fought in the Middle East in, in, in our generation, and actually apparently prior, uh, apparently a little bit prior to that, were fought on behalf of Israel and paid for by APAC, right? So yeah, there are people who are incentivized to go along with it, like uh, uh, um, the military industrial complex is incentivized to go along with it because they profit if we choose to engage in these wars. But right. the reason that it's so predictable, right, is because they know you're going to do whatever the hell APAC tells you anyway. So we might as well profit yeah. off of it. <laughs> Precisely. So it's like they're not like any other lobbying group. They are the biggest, probably the single biggest problem in Washington D.C. Of course, they make, they make they they actively force politicians to pass laws and make decisions that are actually antithetical to the national security of the United States. <sighs> You know, when, when, you, when you see our Democratic and Republican politicians, you know, even state this or is it a state that, oh, yeah, we, we, we care about the people. But, you know, we still got to do a defense act right now. We still got to help out. And as it recently stands right now, House Democrats are seeking to do a force to vote on a Senate forward aid bill to give billions of dollars of aid to Israel, Ukraine and other foreign countries. Yet the American people still get nothing like billions of dollars of treasure. Not a, not a mere, not a. Nothing went, went to Ukraine now to Israel. And it's it just I, I always have to now laugh at anyone who says, well, we, we don't really have the money to, to fund our schools or to invest into our infrastructure. It's our, 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 our wallets, you know, they're, they're empty right now. It's like, no, you know, they're not. You're, you're using the money gun. Go on Israel, on Ukraine and all that other stuff. Yet we get nothing in return. And so in, in many ways, you know, we we. We see people speaking out, and I'm wondering how long this momentum will last until the dreaded Trump derangement syndrome is turned up to 11 because we are an election year. And no matter what, whoever sits in the White House, be it Donald Trump or Biden, APAC's still going to get its way. Um, but what what is the breaking point for people to break away from the two party system and more importantly, to continue on this momentum of trying to stop this genocide? Because. We, we, I've covered on this show, I've read a couple articles here too on this show in regards to how Netanyahu wants this war to go up to 2025. And you know what that means? We're going to get past the death toll of 28,000. Are we looking at 30,000, 50,000, 100,000 dead men, women, and children? Already the attacks are happening in Rafa. Already we're seeing the imagery of young children being torn apart. Are we going to get to that death toll? What is the breaking point, Nico? Um, I don't, I don't know, man. I, I honestly feel like Trump derangement syndrome has been actually knocked down a peg because of how awful Biden has been. It's like they can thank Biden for that shit. It ain't even Trump. That <laughs> it's like, wow, we thought that Trump was the worst thing that could happen to us. And yet, not only are we about to be involved in World War III because of Biden, but this genocide is happening right under his nose, and he's not and he's funding it. And oh, by the way, I'm fucking broke. So it's like all that, and I can't buy groceries. So um, I think that we are actually witnessing faith in the two-party system kind of uh, de degenerate in front of us. Mm -hmm. But it's going to take more than that for this particular issue to, to start to pass. And I actually believe what's probably going to end up happening is within the next year, Israel is going to be invaded. I think that's what's going to happen. It's not going to be by us, obviously. Mm -hmm. But wow. I think what the... I, I, I truly believe what Iran, uh, Lebanon, potentially Syria... In Iraq are waiting for 
uh, and maybe even Egypt, because whenever um, so there was a, a peace deal between Egypt and Israel that only could be maintained if Israel didn't bomb Rafa. Yeah, that's just out the out the door. And CC actually started mobilizing aircraft and tanks on the border because of it. So, wow, they're waiting for Russia to finish the proxy war, uh, not the proxy war. Excuse me, the that regional war with Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, because Russia's smart and they're not going to overextend themselves. But Putin's made it very clear he don't fuck with Netanyahu, mm -hmm. and more so, he's made it clear that he is about denazifying the world. And in in, I mean, how much more Nazi can you get? And what we're seeing right now in Israel, it's literally yeah. a genocide. Uh, it, it, not unlike the, the Holocaust. And and if uh, and also if we look what's also happening in the West Bank, where you're, I know about Yusef brought this up with his uh, interview with Pierce Morgan about what's hap what what happens to the people in the West Bank when you have the settlers coming in and forcibly removing people from their homes, murdering people areas. Yes, murdering people as well, and going to these farms and destroying their crops. You know, one thing that was was really shocking. I had no idea that a lot of those olive trees, some of them could be like eight hundred years old, and that is like. That, that is a moment in time in history, some a, a living entity that old and then being ripped from the roots and then they're pouring concrete where it's at 800 years is gone. How many generations of of Palestinian farmers raised mm -hmm. those wait, raised those crops and, uh, you know, use them and, and and so much more. It's just it's it's um it's it's a loss. It's criminal, man. And, no, not only is it criminal, it's 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 the fact that we'll never see a wonder like that ever again. And so I want you now to explain this right here. This is called the emergency response to families in Gaza. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this organization? Already yeah. people have donated eight thousand two hundred dollars to this uh, aid right now to help out the Palestinian uh, families and people in Gaza. As we all know, there's a genocide taking place there. Can you elaborate on this organization? Yeah, so it's a Palestinian-ran organization that was a nonprofit that invited me, and um, they've been actually consistently giving aid since the cause started, and these, the organization is actually ran by Palestinian refugees. So when I was in Egypt, that's, that's what I was doing, was packaging up the aid from, that was bought from previous fundraisers, and you know we obviously said we have to pay it forward with our influence now so that we can raise money for the next round of purchases that need to be made, um, which unfortunately are going to have to be made all too soon, given everything that's happening over there in Gaza. Um, we, we, we bought non-perishables or we packaged non-perishables because obviously we are aware of, of what's happening. We know that they're, they're being assholes and trying to prevent some of the trucks from getting through. So, uh, but this isn't the first time that's happened. Uh, it, even with this organization, this, this, they had a truck that got, um, they got held back for like a week or two, but eventually the aid was allowed through and, and those Gazan families did receive all the items that they, uh, that they had in the truck because, you know, they're not perishable. So uh, all that stuff has been accounted for. Uh, we have a goal of $25,000, which isn't much. $20 actually buys, provides a box of non-perishables and uh, toiletries and feminine hygiene products for one person for a week. So, um, you know, get a lot of bang for your buck. And for those of you who are looking for, I know it's, it's, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, right now trying to take advantage of the situation by fundraising and they're not, they're not real fundraisers. We, we see that shit all the time, unfortunately, when it comes to tragedies like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know a lot of people are looking for a verified, secure way to know that if you do donate, that that money is gonna go to the cause and make and, and th those items want to get to the Palestinian people, and so this is a way for you to actually be able to do that. Because I'm not gonna, y'all know me, I'm not gonna promote it if it's not secure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I was, I talked to the Palestinians, work with the Palestinians. If you go to my Instagram at Real Nico House, you actually see the videos, uh, all the videos of me in Egypt with the other influencers um, and and the Palestinians who put the nonprofit together. So, and this isn't going to be the only fundraiser uh, for Palestine. Uh, and it actually might not even be my last trip to Egypt. I might actually be going back in a couple of months. And um, what we do want to do also, though, is uh, turn that momentum into an attention into some of the other issues that are happening right now in all over Africa, really. But we, but we want to go to uh, Congo. They, they, want to, they want to do a trip to Kenya, Sudan. So um, we, we had a really solid group, man. We really did have a we were fortunate enough to have a very solid group. 
uh, like I said, that were willing to, because you know how social media is. Some people don't like politics. And yet these people right. were willing to lose followers or whatever because this cause is that important to them. And so I was very, very thrilled to get the opportunity to actually get out, get up and go to Egypt to go do something. Because I know a lot of people uh, would have liked the same opportunity if they could have it. Well, I encourage everyone to please visit your Instagram account. I actually was following you along as you were uh, in Egypt. Um, and while this might be a little personal, um, was there any story that really stood out to you in regards to speaking to the refugees? Because we see the imagery and, you know, it's one thing to watch something on social media or to see a picture. Uh, and, you know, we can all have our own opinions of until we're there on the ground and we witness the story happening firsthand before us. Was there any person or story that really stood out in regards to how they escaped Gaza and are currently now in Egypt? Uh, could, would you care to elaborate on that? So it wasn't really a story about how they escaped Gaza as much because a lot of them actually didn't go through some of a lot of those refugees didn't go through Rafa border. They went through other borders to get. Oh, to wow. Egypt. Yeah. So. Uh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 So not the problem is, is those crossings are more dangerous. So you don't see a lot of them going through the other borders. But the thing that actually stood out to me was playing with the kids um, and hanging out with the kids. And they, I mean, they were having a time of their lives and it was really dope. But the reality is like, I knew when, so whenever we were kids, we were elementary school, we go to recess, we go to school, we're gonna go home to our mom and our dad, our brothers, our sisters, play games, watch TV, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, these people are gonna go home. These kids are gonna go home. They're not going home to their mom and dad. Their mom and dad are dead, a lot, most of them. Mm -hmm. Their brothers and sisters, they have none of their brothers and sisters, or they only have one or two of their brothers and sisters because the others are dead. Uh, some of them have no idea where their family is because um, their family took them and, and basically dropped them off so that they would have a chance to live. Um, that's the, what stood out because they were having, you know, they were very positive. They were having the time of their lives. We really enjoyed ourselves. We enjoyed spending time with them. We're thankful for the opportunity. But, you know, as a person who has siblings and very, very close to my siblings, um, you know, I just thought like to myself, like, wow, they are not going to, they're going to go home after this. We're going to, I'm going to go back to my hotel. I'm going to go back to my family. I get back to the U.S. and I'm going to have positive, uh, uh, positive memories about this positive experience. And I'm going to go back to my life. But those those positive memories will be followed up by the unfortunate reality of their situation and circumstances. And they're eight, nine, 10 years old. You know, it's uh, it's not right, man. It's not right. And it's it's when you see it, the, the consequences of our imperialism up close and personal. It'll, it'll change you. It'll, it'll radicalize you. Um, and it, you really end up with this sinking feeling that you, you're never doing enough. But, you know, you do have to manage your expectations and know, like, you're, you know, we are we're all doing what we can. Um, and but when you do have the opportunity to do more, make sure you try to take it. Precisely, man. Um, you know, obviously, I've, I've been saying on the show and I've been being consistent about it when this war, when this conflict will end and it will, however long it will be going on, there's always a beginning, a middle and an end. Um I have said that this war is going to lay the foundations for the next war. Um, you can't look me straight in the face and say that after everything is done, once the guns are silent, that the survivors of Gaza are just going to be smiling and just saying happy that there's oh, that, yeah, happy no. that, there's, that there's peace. Like, no, there's 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 no going back from this after the amount of terror and destruction that that we have seen. Those kids are ready right now. So so if if, if anything, if anything. What what what's the biggest what is what, what is the biggest takeaway that we that we as Americans can do to actually show the world that we are not part of the sociopathic system that our government has created because it's our government that's doing this. It's our politicians that are bought off and owned by APAC that are doing this. It is our politicians that say they care about the people, but yet do nothing. You have they Bernie Sanders. You have Bernie Sanders uh, do a do nothing bill. You have AOC doing a word salad about the crisis in Gaza. You have Cori yeah. Bush, who's going to be losing her primary or potentially losing her primary because the great progressive uh, coalition of 2016 is not only fractured, it's never going to come 
come back together again. And you have Biden saying that it's a tragedy, but yet still doing nothing. And Netanyahu not even acknowledging the president of the United States or any other government institution or envoy or international body. There is a genocide taking place. Even the ICJ. Even the ICJ that is ruling alongside with South Africa in regards for South Africa calling out the apartheid actions of Israel, it seems that the people now, it falls upon us to take the initiative. What more can people do to really step up? Because many, many Americans, and unfortunately this is because of our media, uh, are ignorant into the overall history of Palestine and Israel and the 75 plus years of unchecked destruction. Well, the way you do what we're doing now, uh, educate yourself. Like you said, many people are ignorant to the history. Educate yourself. Be willing to have that uncomfortable conversation with people around you. Uh, and then help them understand that they have a responsibility to have that conversation as well. Um, er, you know, help within your capacity. Uh, and also, don't be too hard on yourself. It's hard not to. Uh, I wake up every day and it's like the first thing on my mind. It's one of the last things on my mind before I go to sleep. Um, but... They know that the majority of us don't support this bullshit. It's not the truth is we people are doing everything. They're, they're protesting every day. They're disrupting meetings. They're disrupting Congress. They're calling out the politicians. You got conservatives and uh, leftists doing what they can within their capacity. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really up to the, these 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 government leaders from around the world. Got to stop being bitches. Mm -hmm. They need. To, yeah. That's what it comes down to. Like they need to go there and punch Netanyahu in the mouth. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, no, that's, go that's ahead. I mean, really what it takes. Like, like they need to do they, it, the Houthis, whatever the Houthis doing, everybody needs to do that shit. Mm -hmm. um, and they and we, we what we know is is that they would have the support from their people. So it's not like they wouldn't have the support to do it. But er, once again, I believe that. Netanyahu and Israel in general, they're fucked because I believe that Iran, is, they're just waiting on Russia to get done mopping up the mess that they left after beating the shit out of Ukraine. Um, and once Russia kind of mentally and emotionally recuperates from that, I think that it's about to pop off. I don't think that Iran, Iraq, Syria, I think they, all of them are done with, because uh, you have to know West Bank is next. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what I'm so like, if you don't give them any consequences for Gaza, you know, the West Bank is next. And why is the West Bank next? Because we know that Israel has this idea of a greater Israel, a biblical Israel. And that includes parts of Lebanon, that includes parts of Iran, that includes parts of Iraq, Afghanistan, I think, too. So like, they're going to let that shit slide? No. But I do believe that they understand because you have the United States peering in the background, waiting for somebody to, 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 to strike. You have to have Russia there to buffer that so that, it, that, so that the United States can be kept in check while Iran, Le Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria handle the business, and Yemen um, handle their business. So I think that that is what we're going to see happen. Um, and, but you have to think that could be part of the reason why the United States keeps funding Ukraine directly beside Israel. Because they know if we don't keep Russia occupied, we don't know what happens next. Yeah, the sequel we all dread, World War III. And then once those nukes launch, folks, there will be no great reconstruction and the survivors will envy the dead. Ah, great. And there's so much still that I want to do. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot that everyone else in my viewing audience wants to do till, uh, do still as well. I'll leave it to our politicians to be sociopathic and ruin everything. So as a final note, uh, Nico, what other projects are you going to be working on? Where can people follow you online and social media so they can support your work? You've been doing some great stuff, especially with Hotspot. It's, it has been killing it on <laughs> X, formerly known as Twitter, but I prefer to call it Phoenix because you get the X and the bird. <laughs> yeah, look, what? Yes, yes. Put it. Put me in the name. Listen, e all Elon. All you gotta do is write me a check for one million dollars, and here's what you do: you call X Phoenix, right? You still get the bird, but it's a Phoenix bird this time. You still I ain't gonna get lie. X. That's that's kind of fire, kid. Yes, it's kind of fire, bro. I put me lie. in the name. Put me in the game, Coach. Coach Nico, put me in. You're gonna get that home run homer. You're gonna get that touchdown supreme. You're gonna get that. Three point killer shot in the final game before the bell rings, before the buzzer goes alarm, before the ref blows his whistle. Put me in the game, coach. I can name things, okay? Just, I got all these ideas. 
Elon, <laughs> write me, write me that check. I got my criticism of you, but write me that check. And you, and plus branding too. You get to get a little plush. People, people like that Twitter plushie. You get the instead of an X plushie, you get the you get a Phoenix plushie. So they, come on, man. Put, X put, is the shitty in. name. X yeah, is shitty name. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It is. Is he could have called? Elon's actually not good at naming things. I don't know why no. they keep letting him name shit. Space no. X was the laziest shit ever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's the only reason why he called it X too. It's like, hmm. X. Anyways, where can people follow you online on social media, man? <laughs> like you said, uh, uh, Hotspot. You can find us on Hotspot at Hotspot Hotspot on mm -hmm. Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter at Real Nico House with a K, not a C. Uh, mm -hmm. On Instagram and TikTok as well at Real Nico House, and on YouTube for the People Podcast. Uh, or you can just mm -hmm. type in my name, Nico House, so it'll pop up. Um, I've been. If you've been following me, you know I've been live streaming a lot recently. Again, I'm back in the game. Great. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff to talk about, bro. So, oh wait, wait, um, wait, wait! Before you go, I I actually want to ask this of you. I've been noticing something weird with YouTube. Okay, now we know we we, we both know firsthand about the YouTube censorship and all the BS that comes with it. But I noticed you posted something on Twitter, and I've been noticing a few other people have been posting it also on X, Twitter, whatever. I don't, I don't care if it's uh, Phoenix. We're gonna call it Phoenix, right? <laughs> but have you noticed? That it's right now a little bit easier, like 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 the numbers are kind of going up. Uh, people aren't being unsubscribed yeah. as much, or, or 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 am I going nuts? Because I've no, noticed it, it in the last two weeks, and this is kind of raising an yeah, eyebrow. specifically the last two weeks. It's specifically yes, the, la the, the last, last two, two weeks. weeks. I want shoot off on this because you've been hit hard. I know we we here at Heartlands Me have been hit, but I know that you guys took some some real gut checks, especially way back in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, nah, it's. It's been weird. It's been weird because, mm -hmm. you know, still some people say like they're not getting all the notifications, things like that. Like yeah, I kind yeah. of expect that, but yeah, that's me. Um, what what would happen before actually is that um, we would I would post a video, right? No hell, I would be uploading it. It hadn't even been posted yet. The moment that I started an upload process, I would hemorrhage about ten or fifteen follow uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, same here. Same here. Live stream. Same. So like. It was hard to grow, but it wasn't because we weren't growing. Like you could see on the chart, like I would get, I remember one month I had gained 15,000 followers, but I lost 14,800. <laughs> like it was insane. I've never, I'd never seen anything like it. Oh, um, yeah. And when it comes to, when it came to the review process for monetization, mm -hmm. um, they would wait for two, sometimes two, three days, depending on how long your stream was to decide whether or not they're going to allow you to monetize it. If you wow. if they put you in the review process now, um, it's I mean hell I reviewed in, in thirty seconds later it was fine. Uh, Get out! So you know you're not. Quick, 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 quick. No, 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 not thirty seconds later. Come on, are you serious? No, I'm no, I'm dead serious. It was thirty. It was like literally thirty seconds later. Like oh I guess they reviewed it only because of what the description said, and they realized that it wasn't about that or it wasn't anything crazy. So they just okay. Yeah. Wow. So wow. Now, wow. I, the longest that it's taken since in the last couple of weeks has been about two hours to review, but it's it's been strange, and I feel like that Rumble probably had a little bit something to do with that. A lot of people that they kicked off of YouTube went to Rumble, and they're thriving over there on Rumble. So right. uh, okay, thr like thriving, thriving. Like hell, you, Kim Iverson hasn't even been kicked off of YouTube yet, but she's killing on Rumble. Mm -hmm. Everything okay. she drops gets a hundred thousand plus views. You know, so, I, yeah, I've, I've, I've noticed that too on Rumble. We've, we're getting close to 2,500 followers, which is fantastic because, you know, like a month ago, we were only at, at a thousand. And since then, we, 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 oh, wow. we with, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it is, it is pretty impressive how Rumble has been good to us and how we recently got verified on that platform too. So, all right. I, I just wanted to ask you that because you, I just wanted to ask your YouTube question thought on that. And that's been, that's been kind of, that's been putting a, a, a sense of unease in my stomach because I'm just wondering, like, okay, here we go. What's going on here? I'm waiting for the rug to fall, off, uh, you know, be pulled under me. Yeah, again. yeah, no, that's what I've been waiting for too. I'm like, yeah, this is too, it's it's too smooth. It's been mm -hmm. too smooth. Precisely. Like, and the algorithm isn't hiding the my channel as much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, people, you know, there are people who are like, oh shit, I haven't seen your channel on YouTube in forever. Like, <clears throat> not because they've been avoiding it, but because like. The algorithm just hadn't been showing my videos to them. And out of nowhere, somebody said they hadn't, they hadn't looked at my channel in months. Um, and they hadn't known I posted, but just recently it suggested that they watch me again, which was super bizarre. So 
Um, I don't know what's going on, man, but I think that Rum Rumble is keeping them honest. <clears throat> but also, there's a chance that there could be some lawsuit pending or brewing mm -hmm. behind the scenes that we're not privy to. And so they're okay. going out of their way to correct course um, so that they don't feel the, the negative impact of that uh, to the same degree if they do lose a case. Because that's what a lot of times will happen, right? You'll see a company that's about to get sued. Nobody knows they're about to get sued. But all of a sudden, things start, start they start correcting course. Mm -hmm. And you find out, oh, it's because they're going through this lawsuit and they don't want to get exposed in the discovery phase. Um, so back, it could be a combination of both of those things. Both, uh, and remember, mm -hmm. uh, Brussel Brand is primarily posting on Rumble now for his live streams. Uh, Tucker Carlson doesn't really post he posts on youtube but he's posting on his own network twitter and rumble mm -hmm. um uh alice jones rumble like you have a lot of the major made the 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 what i refer to as the algorithm gatekeepers that were on even fresh and fit they post on rumble now oh wow they, oh yeah they are doing that okay yeah i forgot yeah. i forgot about, I, I so forgot it about just politics, yeah, okay. bro it isn't just politics it's a it's it's like people's first stop isn't youtube all the time anymore and that was what kept YouTube in the, you know, ahead of the game. Right. So and I think that advertisers are starting to complain. Because remember, we all, I've always said, like, the thing about YouTube is that they be stealing from your ass. They'll yeah. demonetize you and still advertise on your page. But the problem is when YouTube is saying this is how much an ad costs, they're getting their metrics back. I'm like, motherfucker, why is nobody seeing the ads? Oh, well, we took off Russell Brand. Or we stopped him from live streaming. We, we stop. We don't have Alex Jones anymore. We don't have Fresh and Fit anymore. We don't have X, Y, and Z. You know, Joe Rogan doesn't primarily stream on YouTube like that anymore. Yeah. Um, and the advertisers are starting to notice that less eyes are getting to the videos, mm -hmm. are getting to their yeah. ad. So what the fuck am I paying for it? Exactly, and hey, look, just 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 a few, just a few more minutes of your time because I'm because because we opened up Pandora's box here because if we remember before this was even before 2016 when corporate media was jealous of YouTubers uh, like for example PewDiePie when they wrongly framed him as wearing a Luftwaffe outfit when he was wearing a British bombardier outfit just just mm -hmm. just, just to pull out that old Soprano quote. Notre Dame and Notre Dame, two different things altogether. Luftwaffe uniform of the of the German Third Reich Air Force, and then the British bombardier outfit. Two different uniforms, two different countries altogether, and that caused like the first adpocalypse in which corporate media was saying, "Well, we're gonna come in here and start regulating." Now that eyeballs are being removed away, well. Who if 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 the money's not flowing because it all comes down to the dollars, no one's gonna care about cancel culture or people exactly. being like exactly. it's, it's like okay, wait a minute, the money's the briefcase is getting lighter. Like that scene, I got gotta bring up that scene from Casino when Joe Pesci's character saying like, yeah. Then the bosses realized that the briefcases were getting lighter. If the briefcase is getting lighter, everyone's gonna okay, what's going on here? Bring bring it all back. Whatever, whatever we did, we got to reverse it so the money starts flowing in again. I just yeah. want to get your thoughts on like is is, yeah, is it no, all I, about the dollars? <laughs> it's I mean it's always about the money. It's like <laughs> that's really that's what it's always about. At the end of the day, it's about the bottom line. And the the truth is, Rumble is the first platform that like so. For example, I like Rockfin better. I think Rockfin is actually a better platform. I believe it's a smoother platform. It's easier mm -hmm. to find your people. It's not as clunky, but Rumble actually is the first platform that has the money to compete. That's the difference. And they have the experienced investors because some of them invested in YouTube and were pissed at what YouTube became, right? So uh, when you are able to take literally the big, because people, people think that they're more popular for political YouTubers, for example, than there actually are. They're not that many. You think that they are because of like, oh, man, there's got to be more Glenn Greenwalds out there. No, there's only one Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. There's no, only one man. Kim Iverson, right? Yeah. There's only one Jimmy Dore. There's only, and mm -hmm. there might be some people that come, but there are more people that go than there are people that come, mm -hmm. right? And there, there are only so many Glenn Greenwalds, Kim Iversons, Jimmy Dores, uh, uh, um, like even, I don't like Fresh and Fit, but like that type of, there are only so many of those people on in the world, let alone on YouTube. And if you take, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 of those guys off of YouTube, YouTube's hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, no, what are they going to do? Rely on Tewati? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not watching that shit. YouTube be spending money to make uh, uh, TYT relevant. They oh, <laughs> ain't making no money off of TYT. Dude, come on, man. They're already down. Quit, 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 quit kicking on them, man. Jenk is already trying to run as president of the United States. Can't you give him a break? 
look, man, no, fuck that guy. Um, <laughs> I, I was just watching him. I was watching him do, cover the the Tucker Carlson interview. Oh this no! Man, why did watch? you watch that shit? Did you watch it? No, he didn't even watch no. it. He said Tucker didn't inter didn't interrupt Putin for an hour. I was like, what? That's not true. He was interrupting him probably too much in the first part of the interview. I was wow. like, hold on. Did these motherfuckers not watch the interview and yet they're dedicating a 30 minute segment to an interview that they didn't watch? Well, that's 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 what corporate media does all the time, especially yeah. when that report came out for of Biden's mental health. Um, the I remember Rachel Maddow and two other Jagoff pundits from MSNBC. The one guy said, well, I didn't read the report yet. You're going to go live on air and not read it. You're just going to spout out your opinion. You should say, hey, I'm going to give my opinion. You just say live on air. I didn't read it. Well, you Fucking didn't lie. read it. Just at least lie about it. Don't even say it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why? Why would you do that? There's the amount of stupidity. I I I didn't want to waste my time watching the the TYT stuff because I don't want to give them a view or you know even either. That I know it's hard, bro. Yeah, yeah. it's. Well, yeah, when people send it to me and they request it, I'm like, uh, I guess I put yeah. myself through this. You my, got my people. Yeah, I, I, I gotta get up out of here, bro. Oh, like, yeah, I gotta get yeah, up yeah, out of here. Yeah, you do, you do. All right, so listen. If you gotta head on what, one more time, where can people find you on social media? A hot spot. Mm -hmm. uh, on Twitter, on, or really mm -hmm. on, on all platforms, you can find me on Hotspot, but at Hotspot, Hotspot on Twitter. Uh, you can find me uh, at Real Nico House on Twitter and mm -hmm. on every other platform. And on Rumble, obviously, you can look me up, uh, Nico House, uh, or For the People Podcast, whichever one. Um, right. And on YouTube as well. All right, and Rock Fan, of course. And Rock Fan. Fantastic note to end on. Nico, thank you so much for your time. Uh, if you're going to be coming to Chicago for the DNC convention, let me know. I'm trying to put together an Avengers team uh, to, to cover I'm, it. I'm debating <laughs> it. I'm debating it, man. Right, if, well, it's, if it's summertime, I might yes. be able to make it happen. Summertime, summertime August. July? Yeah. No, it's going to be August. August okay. I, might, I might be able to make that. Oh, actually, I think I'll be in the States. Okay. Well, so let, that let, might work let, out. Might work well, out. let me know. Let, let me know what's up. But until then, folks, please follow Nico House on all of his social media. Until then, folks, we're going to continue on with the rest of our main show. Thank you for your time, Nico. Of course, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. This isn't such an awful place. Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days. And to still think you're right here awake. The cost of living isn't much to make But God, it's so hard to save And when they told you everything was safe Were you safe? Mm. Were you safe? Were you safe? Mm -hmm. Were you safe? I guess this isn't such an awful place. Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days. to me but god it's so hard to say and when they told you everything was safe were you safe were you safe were you safe Off the masses, the brand new cancerous growth who has come here to vie for your vote. Come here to cry at the camps and to mourn at the shore for the bodies that float by the wreck of an immigrant boat. Then it's back to their luxury home. Couple security booths and a moat. Couple cigars, a little escargot, a little booze and a soak. Just breathe in the steam and the smoke. Pink salt, lavender, candles are low. Shit, when you do what you do, gotta lighten the load. And he got a life of his own that's a sight to behold. And it's a lot to control to decipher the code or decipher the soul. The cost of a good night's sleep for the working elite is a bargain no matter the toll. Mm. Worth any wager and that comes straight from the mouth of the means to the goal that will swallow us whole. 
ripe for the picking if you don't mind mold and you know I don't maybe we're pleasantly prone maybe we're taking a licking compliantly ticking and ticking and ticking but never explode no, I don't deliver the prettiest image, but damn if it is an accurate vision of natural vision, of rage at the system and abject heartbreak, patiently waiting for any who will listen. That little blue bird who was watching your words is a federal carrier pigeon, a Langley first. It's a patient observer who hears what it wants and is trained for the worst. Oh, you got nothing to hide. They'll be the ones to decide that after they root through your purse, after they read all your texts, after they raid your apartment, confiscate all of its contents, then conjure up evidence out of the air on a wing and a prayer and malicious intelligence nonsense. Any presumption of innocence long since gone, right along with your comforts and constants. Historically first, they will come from the communists. <laughs> so why in the fuck would I say I'm a communist? Well, it might be I love my community more than the monsters of opulence who are holding us hostage, who are vomiting promises. Might be I'm all done seeing our pensions and benefits harvested. Might be I'm all done watching the populace being disarmed in the guise of an armistice. Watching a woman collapse on the floor who will rise no more. She is wheeled out the door and you're next in line for the pharmacist. If you can get me to vote, it's a hard no confidence. But part of the charm of deception is politics wearing the mask of incompetence. It's all in the art of austerity, darling. It's all in the slide of the providence. Until home is as wide as your cubicle height and it's only as deep as your coffin is. Maybe I'm miles away from impatience, aching to break off the head of the snake where the capital lost reptile brain and the margin of profit is. Like off with his. Like off with his. I guess this isn't such an awful place Is that what you want me to say? You prove it's possible to sleep for days And to still think you're right here awake The cost of living isn't much to make But God, it's so hard to say And when they told you everything was safe 